Every serious incident on the road requires forensic examination. And inside the cordons, dedicated officers take on this challenge. Move! He's, he's got something to answer, why hasn't he stopped in time? This is the collision investigation team from Gwent Police. Someone has got to do something wrong for it to happen on this road. So what was he doing? I can't see any logical explanation. Tracking down the evidence. See it? It's there. To get to the truth. The physical evidence is the physical evidence. The only way you can generate these marks is when you're applying heavy braking. Where the impact has occurred, and it will drop all the mud. That's where his head sits. We refer to it as a bullseye. That's one hell of a swerve. All in a day's work for the crash detectives. Police emergency. Somebody's just knocked somebody down, I think. Car has come across the road. Somebody on the side of the pavement. I'm looking at my window, there are guys running to the trap. He's on the side of the road. They're putting blankets on the trap on the pavement. But you messed up. A 24-year-old man has been seriously injured after being hit by a car in this residential street in Combran. What's the condition of a pedestrian? Um, oh, it's head injury, lower limbs injury. It's serious, whether it's life-changing or life-threatening this time. Forensic collision investigator PC Chris Goddard must now start piecing together how this crash happened. A car came from that end of the road came to rest here, and the pedestrian came to rest where the blanket is. The injured man was treated on the pavement before being taken to hospital by ambulance. What have you got? Chris and his colleague PC Rhys Dickinson are now hunting for evidence to reveal exactly where he was when he was struck. Let me have a look at his shoes. I'm just looking for evidence of the scuffs on the bottom of the shoes. When a car hits a pedestrian and they get you know, basically their legs taken out from underneath them, the, uh, your shoes will leave their own scuff marks. We've got scuff material on the top here, which is quite interesting. Depends on how violent the impact is. Your foot will roll over and it'll actually be the top of the shoe that gets scuffed onto the road surface. So, unfortunately, it's the middle of the night, we've got tarmac and we've got black leather. With a mark like this tricky to find in these conditions, they need to rely on other evidence. There's a story that's indelibly written into the road surface and the crashed cars, which will tell us what happened. Right, where are our marks? And the clues here begin to reveal the exact route the vehicle has taken. Oh, we've got the curb strike here. This is the front and rear passenger side of the BMW as it's mounting the pavement. The driver is desperately trying to steer to the right. Come across the pavement here. And straight into the brick wall. So we can put the position of the car exactly where it was as it hit the pavement here. Seven, the rear passenger side. Eight is the front passenger side. With corresponding marks on the near side wheels as it's gone sideways into the curb, this movement of the car is backed up by even smaller clues. Yeah, you've got some lovely ones there. All right, so that's a bit of gravel from the pavement, but it's been caught by the tire as it's rolled over the top. So on the other side, it's been ground flat and it's polished. That is what is leaving these little scratch marks. Fire brigade have taken the roof off, but that door was there naturally. It was the impact with the wall that's taken the door off. 
If there were a passenger in that seat, they would have taken the brunt of the impact. Let's have a look at this. Right, that's upside down. All these puncture marks are brick as it's hit the wall down there. The man driving the BMW was cut free by fire crews. Driver's currently in hospital, but he was sufficiently uninjured. He was able to get a breath test here. And that's negative, absolutely zero. So he hasn't been drinking. Chris and Reese now need to work out just why he's lost control of his car. There's salt on the road surface. There's no ice here, but it is cold. So there's no reason that we can see for somebody to drive and lose control because of ice or some other reason. There's a huge amount of evidence here, but it takes us to get that information. Type is 19. Passed his test six months ago. The car's less than four months old. The driver's account is that he's driving quite normally, around 30 miles an hour, without any calculations, without any science. You just look at it and go, this is not 30 miles an hour. You know, no matter how reckless you want to be at 30 miles an hour, you can't leave those sorts of marks and cause that sort of damage. We know it's going quickly. How quickly, we don't know yet, but we will. But as well as saying he's travelling at the speed limit, the driver's now given a further explanation. We're aware he made some comment to people treating him that he swerved for a cab. Well, that's one hell of a swerve. You don't do that if you swerve for a cab. At 30. At 30. You don't do that if you swerve for an elephant. The evidence at the scene may have been gathered, but the full story behind this crash is still unclear. There's more work to do. There's been a serious crash involving a motorcyclist in the village of Raglan. Collision investigator PC Richie Wyatt is on his way. You see there. And he's already concerned about what he's going to find. It's a rural area. A lot of motorcyclists use that road. When it came in as a collision with a motorcyclist in a car, you instantly think it's not going to be a good outcome. And he's getting updates over the radio about the motorcyclist's condition. The paramedics are saying that his uh, injuries are now life-threatening. They require fast ambulance escort now to get him to uh, Neville Hospital as soon as they can. The crash has happened right outside a garden centre. And with evidence on the road surface needing to be preserved, customers haven't been allowed to leave. Elder gentleman and his wife pulled out of the garden centre. In the RAV? In the RAV, yeah. Motorcycle had come round and obviously made contact with the side of it. Although the windows have gone on the car, no, there's no injuries in that car as well. Let's go for CCTV. Yeah. I've already asked, there isn't any. With no cameras covering this section of road, Richie and his colleague Dean Burnett must find the evidence to reveal what's happened here. We've got the black car there, it has come out of this garden centre, turning right. As the vehicle is turning right, the bike's approaching. The bike has collided with the side of the car and come across the ridge and hit the signpost and come to rest there. So say we need to establish um, the exact positions of the vehicles at the moment of impact. The rider's taken the mirror off and then it's gone further into the car. This is the most significant area of impact here, which peeled the door skin back um, and then continued into causing this amount of intrusion. But the damage reveals more. Sometimes a rider will react and drop the bike and slide. You can tell from the amount of damage that the bike and the rider is still more or less upright at this point. 
and they suspect this gouge was created as the two vehicles made contact. You've got that mark coming off you now, haven't you? So we say, it can't be this vehicle's cause it, because whatever's coming is, is his exit that way when the motorcycles come to rest. So as the bike has gone into the side of the vehicle, the tyre has come away. The rim has dug into the road surface, and as a result, it's caused a gouge. But the evidence is even more widespread. If I show you, the debris is scattered in this area. There's a big lump of tarmac, which is still sticky. The front wheel's still rotating. So as he's rotating, it's, it's thrown this part of the road surface off. As you can see, that's very fresh. You know, it's glistening the tarmac, it's quite soft. That's showing the point of impact, the gouging. The markings on the actual uh, rim of the wheel of the motorcycle and this in between the point of impact and the motorcycle, so it's painting a picture. There's two scenarios, uh, who is at fault? Is the bike going too fast? Or has the car pulled out in front of the motorcycle because the driver of the vehicle hasn't seen the motorcyclist? and is the driver's fault. Still in first gear, D? Yeah. It's just consistent with him pulling out the junction. You know, probably he's just in the process again second, I would have thought. Was that gate up? That's that exit, isn't it? Does it say exit the other side? It was open at the time. So the officers now need to work out just how far into the turn the car was at the time the impact occurred. What we're trying to establish is, has that vehicle completed its manoeuvre and is then on its correct side of the road going straight ahead? To be over there at that point of impact, unless he's really cut that corner, then, you know, he, he has completed that manoeuvre. He's on his correct side of the road, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's got to be there, Dean, look. Yeah, so he's, he's hit it on the curb, he's smashed it on the curb, it's just gone sliding. Focus must now turn to the bike and its rider. Witnesses have suggested that the man riding the motorbike stayed with it as it crashed. Ah, see a length over there. But if that's the case, what is that? There's evidence here that's not making any sense. Has he got any white on his leathers? As well as the obvious white marks, you've got fragments of material there, look. Like. It's got a little bit of red in it. It's, uh, it looks like plastic-type material. Well, now there's red on the bottom of his boots. What we've just found is marks on the road. The scrape marks and scratch marks. So, from that, you've deduced. He's come away from the bike just after impact and slid along the road to this point. His clothing remains where he was treated by paramedics. Fair old tumble, innit? Yeah. You know. He's rolling and sliding and... Yeah. And what have The fact he's separated from the bike and travelled such a distance is important to this investigation. The motorcycle has collided with something and the rider is further down the scene and then you expect that it's a significant speed involved. Makes a lot more sense, then. Oh, crikey, yeah. Yeah. Good. The motorcyclist is now in a stable condition in hospital. And with the road surface examined, garden centre customers can finally head home. The scene is now being recorded on camera and with this 3D laser scanner. Its accuracy means it can be used later to build a fuller picture of what happened in this crash. We've got essentially a distance that the biker has travelled after the impact. Call it a throw distance or a roll distance. So the distance potentially has gone down the road. We could use that distance to calculate a speed that the rider was travelling at when he left the bike. Not necessarily the speed of impact, because the impact is going to take speed out of the motorcycle before the rider's thrown off. But the chances are the speed is higher at impact because the speed has been absorbed by the vehicle.
clear that road back to there. But before work at this scene is completed, Dean needs to do one more thing. And then slew side was if possible to there. So it gives an idea of where the car was when it was struck. Tidy. Oh. He's coming there, look, and I guess that's not far off, eh? And it's also revealed the level of force involved. So as a motorcycle has hit the car, there's enough impact with the bike to physically push the back end of the car across to the grass verge. It's as close as you've got to get it. OK, great. Gives us a good idea of the position of both vehicles at the time of the impact. The shape of that bike there, look, and the damage. Lines it up nice. Yeah, it does. Bike's on the wrong side of the road, and the car is completely on the opposite side of the road, having cleared the junction. The fact that it's happened on the wrong side of the road starts ringing alarm bells. So why is his bike the wrong side of the road? The six-month-old motorcycle was on loan to the rider while his own bike was being serviced. The frame is gone from the impact. Inquiry team officer PC Di Thomas has carried out an inspection. It's a very good bike from a company. Courtesy vehicle, so it's well checked before it goes out. And no mechanical defects were found that could have caused the crash. He's riding this courtesy bike out with his two friends. He was the third bike, so he was at the back. They've come from the Bristol area over the Seven Bridge. The following day, we had a phone call from the garage that provided the courtesy bike to the rider. They had information that we thought would be useful with our inquiry. So Richie's now heading off to see the company, joined by officer in the case, PC Tim Lloyd. Chris? Richard? Yeah. There was obviously more than one of them, I would guess. If, if three of them, yeah, and he was tail end Charlie playing a bit of catch up, we may have been as well. The courtesy bike itself had a tracker fitted to it. Yeah, it's tracker fitted on all our bikes. Pure reason of a tracker fitted to a courtesy bike is if it gets stolen or doesn't get returned, then hopefully they can retrieve the bike. But it could play an additional role here. So how does the tracker work then? So, it's, so it activates as soon as the bike is switched on and started in? Yeah, well, what it does is this shows every journey. And the tracker was active and has recorded the route for the entire journey leading up to the crash. Richie is keen to know what more it might reveal. And that's the point of collision. So could we interrogate that to see what speed he's doing here? Is that possible, no. would you know? No. There might only be limited details available here. Right. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. But Richie's convinced there could be more data. The nature of global positioning, it's recording the position of the bike and the actual route is taken, but also as it sends the signal every second up to a satellite, it's timing that bike. And if it's timing something over a distance, then it's going to start providing speeds. With evidence from the scene already suggesting that speed may have been a factor in this crash, details like this could be key. So you can analyse driving efficiency, such as braking, cornering and acceleration. So Richie's researching the company that fits and monitors the tracker. They provide the full service, is whether we have access to that information. Uh, we'll have to speak to the company and see. As Richie focuses on the journey taken by the bike, back in the office, Dean's concentrating on what the aftermath of the crash can tell him. The data captured by the 3D laser scanner has been downloaded to create this virtual version of the scene. So motorcyclist's point of impact is in this area. The motorcycle and rider hit the road in this area. The motorcycle's gone that way, and the rider has gone, continued along the road that way. 
The accuracy of this laser scan image means he can take measurements and start making calculations. By putting the, uh, the start of the measurement at the point where the motorcyclist and the motorcycle separated, and then extending the measurement then to where the motorcyclist came to rest, you can see it's measured 37.5 metres. By using this distance the rider slid along the road surface, using the mass equates to a speed of around 49 miles per hour. So that's the post-impact um, speed, that is the speed after the impact with the car. So if he was travelling at 49 miles per hour even after hitting the car, what would his speed have been before the impact? Richie's just had some more details from the tracker, so they could be about to find out. So we've had a reply from the company, and there's an Excel spreadsheet of data, really. 1326 is down to zero, so that's the crash. As well as the coordinates of the route being taken by the bike. The full data from the tracking company has indeed recorded the speeds being travelled by the rider. I haven't dealt with a motorcycle before with a tracker device on it. The rider at the time, whether he was aware there was a tracker on it, I, I doubt very much. That's on the approach to the left-hand bend, and then the collision scene here is that's the entrance to the garden centre. 138 kilometres an hour, 150 kilometres an hour. 93 miles per hour, 150k. So it's saying, at this stage, the bike, called the coordinates, is doing 93 miles per hour. 50 mile an hour stretch of road. At this speed, the bike would not have been visible to the car driver as he pulled out. And then what's the maximum speed you can see on the whole list? But the data's also revealed that in the minutes before the crash, the rider reached even higher speeds. What's that, 170? 180? 198. 198, yeah. so what's that? 198k. 123 mile an hour. You know, even just looking from the simplicity of this map, where they're plotting him at 123 miles per hour, you only want a tractor, any agricultural vehicle, just pulling out there at slow speed. What's he going to do 123 miles an hour, isn't it? The 53-year-old is an experienced rider but the courtesy bike he was using was more powerful than the one he owned. Thankfully, the car driver was uninjured, but the motorcyclist suffered significant serious injuries. It was decided that it wouldn't have been in the public interest to pursue a prosecution against the rider. His standard of riding and the speeds he's achieving prior to the collision, it was only one inevitable outcome just totally, totally irresponsible riding. After a late night crash in Cumbran left a man with serious injuries, the investigation is continuing. The pedestrian was struck by a car as he walked along this residential street. The 19-year-old driver of the BMW now has some questions to answer. And he's maintaining his story about how the crash happened. I was coming towards the bend, and it was an animal had run across the front of the car. I can't remember anything after that, apart from just panicking. If you're going to tell us something, expect us to check it. Don't expect us to take it at face value, because we won't. You able to tell me how fast you were going when you come up the hill? 40, 40 mile an hour maximum. I knew I was, I knew I was going um, a couple over the speed limit, but I wasn't, um, like, you know, aggressively driving, being, being a complete idiot. But since the crash, further inquiries have been ongoing. We always check a scene for CCTV opportunities. There were three cameras in total. There's our poor pedestrian walking up the road, clearly on the footpath. Do you see this lad walking, minding his own business? Has no idea what's coming his way. <laughs> 
you see the car fighting for control and it comes back across onto the correct side of the road. We pick it up on the next camera, just as it's mounting the pavement and into the brick wall. The entire car is on the pavement, coming straight for him. Pretty damn reckless, isn't it? He's not looking behind. He just starts to look tries to run, but the car is straight through. Because we laser scanned, or we've recorded the entire scene as a three-dimensional model. And Chris has been able to analyze this to calculate speeds. As the BMW was coming through, it was doing between the end of this line here and the parked car, it was doing 72 miles an hour between those two points. The driver has been shown the CCTV and told that they know he was traveling at more than double the speed limit. Is there anything you want to say about that at all? When I found out this morning that that was the figure, I, I was truly shocked. I knew I was going over the speed limit, but I wasn't going that fast. As the car hits the pavement, it's still traveling at 60 miles per hour. Fortunately, the car lost most of its speed with that impact with the wall. Without this, the outcome could have been very different. If it had hit the pedestrian at 60 miles an hour, it would have killed him. Is there anything else you want to say in relation to that at all? Just that I'm sorry and I have uh, yeah, Well, I'm, I'm glad that that other person is okay. Um, I wouldn't like if someone was driving at that speed and came into me. The driver admitted causing serious injury by dangerous driving. In court, his actions were described as out of character. The judge said that just because it was late at night didn't mean that there would be no one around and there was a clear reason for a speed limit. These are outrageous speeds. If we could have had a herd of cats coming across the road, it wouldn't have made a difference. He's still, this is still a high speed crash. The driver was sentenced to 16 months in custody, suspended for 18 months, and given a three year driving ban. I've seen an awful lot of CCTV of spectacular crashes, and this is probably the most spectacular where the person in the center of the action essentially gets away with it. The pedestrian has accepted an apology from the driver and says he considers himself very lucky to be alive.